Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're going to go through one of the gun houses and just look at some of the equipment that's in there. Specifically, we're going through Turret 3's gun house, just because we were at the back of the ship when we started filming this. The first neat thing to point out is that the turret uh, doesn't have air conditioning, but it does have ventilation. So you see these ducts here are for sucking air and there's an electrically powered fan in there that's just drawing air in. It's not on right now or it would be very loud. And it's very interesting because there is an armored grating inside of here that the air has to pass through. Even the underside of the turret is armored in case there's an explosion nearby that sends splinters up into it. Uh, at this point, I should probably mention, all three of the turrets on an Iowa-class battleship sit at different heights, uh, with turret one being the lowest mounted, then turret three mounted uh, maybe two or three feet higher, and that's because the stern of the ship underwater is already starting to curve up, so they needed to boost the turret a little bit, and uh, so there's almost enough room to stand under here. And then turret two, of course, superfying over turret one, sits the highest. That has an entire extra story to its uh, barbette. As far as I can tell, turret 3 and turret 1 have the same size barbette. It's just turret 2's, because it's sitting on an incline, is a little bit higher than turret 1's. Uh, while we're talking about the ventilation out here, I should mention, on New Jersey, we're purely sucking air from the underside. Uh, it's not great. Some other battleships, including other Iowa-class battleships like Missouri and Wisconsin, and uh, older battleships like Massachusetts, have, um, I call them ears for lack of anything else, but they're like these curved structures that bend up around the sides and the back of the turret. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what that's doing, if that allows them to draw more air or it prevents them from drawing in all the dirt and stuff from the deck that's just sucking straight up. Um, but some battleships have that feature, others do not. And New Jersey certainly spent a lot of time in the South Pacific, uh, Vietnam, World War II, and as a, uh, operating off Australia in the 80s. So there's no reason for her not to have it that I can think of. It, I guess it's just one of those uh, ship alts that some ships get them, some don't. So here is the museum era ladder to climb up into turret three. And you may notice behind me there's uh, a bunch of teak wood piled up. That's for the deck restoration project. Normally we wouldn't store anything under here. It would be nice and clean. Uh, but it's a good dry place to store this stuff while we're working on the fantail. Now let's head into the gun house. The first feature you notice when you come into the turret is the rangefinder right here. As designed, each of the turrets had one of these as a backup for going under local control. Three sailors here in the gun house um, would have manned the rangefinder. Turret 1's rangefinder was removed uh, around 1950, 1951 before she sails for Korea. And that meant that Turret 1 had three less crew members in there and a whole heck of a lot more space. Turret 3's rangefinder has obviously had some work done in the 80s. Um, this original bicycle type seat I'm sitting on is honestly the most uncomfortable chair I've ever sat on on the ship. Um, it doesn't have a back and it kind of kicks you forward, which I guess is okay when you're supposed to be pressed up against the optic here. This other seat has been replaced with a mess deck chair. Um, and it is not painted the same color as other mess deck chairs, so I assume that is an alteration that was done by the Navy and not by the museum, but it's not outside the realm of the possible. So maybe that chair is more comfortable, although I find the mess deck chairs here to be pretty bad too. Behind me, you can see that the turrets have some batteries here. They can go under their own electrical power if they lose, or if the ship loses power so they can continue to rotate and train a little bit. Other guns have a manual backup where you can crank them around. The 5-inch guns, the 40 millimeters, they can all be operated manually. Uh, the 16-inch gun with a 2,200-ton rotating structure cannot be manually cranked. No amount of gear reduction helps with that. Uh, so, battery backup. 
This weird curved thing here is part of the rammer for the center barrel. So when the rammer is retracted, it slides all the way back in this track and then down around. And when it is actuated, it comes out and pushes the shell into the barrel. As you come up into the gun house, right next to you, you'll have a couple of tanks. This one's been painted like a Foster's beer can, um, just some of the sailor art that the crew did in the 80s. These tanks hold the uh, turret flood water. So um, obviously because the turret rotates, we can't have plumbing pipes coming into it with water. But there's powder in here and you want to be able to flood that if there is an emergency. So it is a gravity system. There's just a couple of tanks of water right here in the back of the turret. And uh, there is no remote control as far as I can tell. There's only a local control station that if there's an emergency, you pull that and it just empties these tanks down through uh, the gun houses, the gun pits, and the lower parts of the turret. When you get down to the magazines at the very bottom, those don't rotate and so there can be plumbing with an actual magazine sprinkler system. Coming through under the uh, rangefinder, we have a couple of interesting features here. Each of the turrets has its own pipe vise in it to do maintenance. And these things are god-awful heavy. Um, they do not make them like that anymore. We have a periscope. There's actually two periscopes in each turret. Uh, and some of the older battleships had their periscopes removed. Uh, could have been part of the scrapping process before they were preserved as a museum. It could have been uh, they were removed to support the Iowas in the 80s. I'm not entirely sure which, but uh, most of the older battleships I've been on just have holes in the armor here where the periscope should be. We still have our periscopes. You've got one wheel here that allows you to turn and another one that allows you to elevate, just like the guns. One side does rotation, one side does elevation. Same here. Uh, <laughs> here's a real cool feature. This is uh, probably unused bore brush for the 16-inch guns. I believe um, this one looks like it is made out of a very highly polished uh, pine, maybe. And then uh, we've got boar's hair, which is good and gritty. And we got brass here. This is a very nice, uh, this is probably an older bore brush. We've also got some like Bakelite and synthetic, uh, much lighter weight ugh, bore brushes that uh, were probably from the 80s. So th that is uh, an interesting artifact right there. And uh, looking over here, you can see where the rangefinder sticks out of the side of the turret. And you notice there's a lot of wiggle room there. That is so you can rotate the rangefinder just a little bit uh, ahead of the turret. Uh, so it gives you a little bit of deflection. You're going to be trying to lead a target, either one way or the other, because the target is probably sailing parallel to you at a certain speed that they may not be matching your speed, so it might be coming in the other direction. So you might need to look at them in advance or plot an offset so that you are leading the target so your shell gets to where they're going to be. Speaking of aiming the guns, each turret has its own Mark III rangekeeper. These are small electromechanical analog computers uh, that are very similar to the Mark VIII rangekeeper that's down in both forward and aft plot. Uh, so if the turrets go under local control, they've got their own rangekeeper. Interestingly, even though turret one lost its range finder and therefore would be hard pressed to uh, find the range to an enemy target, besides the gunnery officer looking through the periscope and guessing, uh, they retained their range keeper. With the range keeper here, we've got a switchboard so that we can uh, determine where we're getting our firing solution from. Are we going under local control? Are we transmitting the plot that we have developed under local control to turret one, which cannot uh, develop its own? We can do all that here from the switchboard. We've got a bunch of other communication stuff. Uh, probably the biggest feature in here are the uh, doors leading into the gun pits. So each barrel is in, a, in its own separate box inside the turret, and that's called the gun pit. And uh, each one has a single access door from inside the gun house. 
They also have ladders coming up from down below. But uh, yeah, so each of these also has a porthole so you can look in there. Uh, both a porthole in the door and a porthole looking into the gun house separately. The ones for the gun house have a battle port that can close. The ones for the doors do not. There are only three gun pits, but there are six doors. So each of the three gun pits has a door. And there's also a door for the elevator operators. Uh, each gun pit has its own powder elevator, and there's uh, room in here for a guy to sit and uh, man that elevator to bring the powder up from all the way down below in the magazines. The final feature that stands out to me in the gun turret is all the eye bolts in the overhead. These things are real headhunters. They're right in the walkway, and I'm, I'm six foot tall. I'm pretty close to average height for a sailor, even back during World War II, and it catches me straight on the forehead. Um, one, it's interesting that they welded this to armor plate, which means you are uh, heating up the armor, which may reduce its effectiveness. So it's clearly something they wanted and needed. Uh, it's got to be for moving equipment around in here. Uh, there is one over the door of each of the, uh, that accesses each of the gun pits. So I'm not sure if that is where uh, you would clip, uh, say when you've got a bore brush, you've got to tie off one end. I'm not sure if that's for that specifically or if it is for putting a chain hoist on so you can lift equipment out of the gun house and out. Because uh, you can, in theory, in a shipyard, remove the roof of the gun house to do maintenance work inside. Um, expensive and complicated, that is. So most of the time you'd be breaking your thing that needs to be replaced down the smallest components possible and then getting them out of here. I can imagine that happened a lot by the end of the ship's career when, when these things were old and well used. Uh, in addition to the ones that are over the gun house doors that might have just been for uh, things like cleaning out the breaches and stuff, there are also some other ones also hanging over the walkways. So um, the gun house is just the top of a five-story rotating structure. Of the roughly 80 sailors who man each turret, 30 are up here in the gun house. They aren't all back here in the turret officer's booth. Three or four would be in each gun pit, one would be in each elevator car pit, so that leaves about a dozen here in the uh, turret officer's booth. That would be the turret officer, uh, the chief in charge of the turret, there's usually one of each of them, and your rangefinder crew and a bunch of communication guys primarily. Uh, so, with the thing all battened down for firing the guns, how do you actually communicate as the turret officer throughout? Well, we got a lot of options here. There are voice tubes into each of the gun pits, so the simplest thing, you can just come up to one and call into it. Uh, there's all sorts of indicator lights that you can signal, there's all sorts of alarms. Here we've got a, a couple of alarms. Uh, and then we've got sound-powered phones. And even sound-powered headsets, so that uh, not only can we communicate with other people in our own turret, the sound-powered systems are often party lines, so you can talk to people throughout the entire uh, gunnery department. So a few final thoughts. Um, earlier we mentioned that the rangefinders could slew around a little. Here is the rail that they can move on so you can see they've, they've got a fair amount of uh, room to train. Here are the wheels that eh, are still greased up that do that. Um, everything in here is a headhunter. So there are two of these um, speakers for the one MCs and they're right head height as you're trying to go into the right gun room. Uh, and finally Look at these welded caps. We've pointed these out on other videos in other parts of the ship and maybe even in the turret, but uh, these are over either bolt holes or rivet holes, so a hit to the outside of the turret isn't going to cause that to shear off and then bounce around the inside here. The turrets are very, very well armored, uh, so this, the uh, bolt head or rivet head, whichever this one happens to be, uh, that's inside this protective cap, if that shears off and bounces around, it is just going to bounce back and forth like firing a uh, gun in a metal box. 
get a lot of ricochets. It could, people are packed in here, so it, it could take out some guys. So the Navy went an extra step and welded these in place. Uh, and that's probably my favorite feature of the construction of the turret, the built up weld beads here. So notice when they welded these uh, plates together, they used a zigzag pattern. That means instead of just welding a straight line, you're welding up and down. It gives you more surface. And notice there isn't just one weld bead here. They welded a bead and then they welded a couple beads over that and then a couple more beads over that. So it's really, really built up. Uh, maybe that's necessary because of the weight and size of this armor plate. Maybe it's just because they really, really didn't trust welding yet when they were building these ships. So again, I'm six feet or one curator tall. How tall are you guys? Would you be banging your head on everything in here? Let us know in the comment section down below. I honestly hit my head more in the engineering spaces than the, the gunnery spaces because in here I'm just naturally hunched down all the time. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of other businesses and individuals. We really appreciate your continued support. There's a link in the description uh, for ways you can donate to the museum. You can also support the museum by liking, sharing, and subscribing. That way more people find out about the channel and our museum. Thanks for watching.